többi Spano, uh, Dr. Gergely német, uh, Deputy Secretary of State for Defense Policy from the Ministry of Defense, will give his uh, uh, speech. Um, so I will, once we <laughs> exited the room, I would kindly ask him to take um, the floor, so to speak. Uh, I hope he doesn't mind that I will let you in on a bit of a secret that uh, he is one of the originators of the of this conference. Uh, we had a talk with him and uh, Dr. Tomás Dezső, the president of uh, the Botanyi Foundation, back in December when we were kind of thinking that we should have something similar, which of course in the <laughs> coming months Shem's formed, uh, but I think uh, a credit goes to him as well as somebody who has been one of the, the co-originators of this uh, conference. Uh, just a really brief bio of him. Uh, besides being a Deputy uh, Secretary of State, he also has been the Defense Policy Director of the Hungarian Ministry of Defense since 2019. Uh, he previously said, served as a Deputy Director for International Cooperation in the Hungarian National Armament Director's Office, and he was also a Senior Defense Advisor in the General Staff. Uh, previously, he was a Deputy Defense Consular for Defense Planning and Defense Policy at the Delegation of Hungary to NATO, our permanent mission. So, thank you again for our panelists, uh, thank you for the audience, and uh, please, uh, Dr. Gergely Nimet, uh, your floor is yours. Thank you very much once again for the opportunity um, to be invited, though apparently this was partially my own idea, so being invited by my <laughs> good protagonist uh, is um, uh, partially lopsided, but also I think it's uh, very important here that the Ministry of Defense is able to add its voice uh, to this conversation. It's also very important and probably a major signal that uh, as people are converging to talk about uh, geopolitics and the return of geopolitics, they are converging in Budapest. It's also, I think, a great signal that we have uh, at least several people, including the Right Honorable Tony Abbott and also James Carafano, who have crossed oceans in order to be here. So thank you very much once again for the interest taken um, in this uh, Budapest, uh, 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 in this security dialogue in Budapest. Also a big thank you to John, Melissa, uh, Istvan and the whole team uh, for making it happen. Uh, and I'm grateful that once again, I can add the voice of the Ministry of Defense to these very important matters. I was, uh, on a personal uh, remark, a bit afraid when all the other people left the row, I was seated and I was like, oh my God, they are all coming there. What should I, what, what should I have left? But then uh, this whole uh, event is really composed in a very neat fashion. And as a, re as a result of the previous forum, it is clearly now understood by all of us that political objectives, strategic thinking, psychology, and willingness was referred and addressed uh, in that uh, forum. Now I arrived with a different agenda, capabilities, because defense policy is about capabilities and the willingness to use those capabilities. Since willingness was already addressed, I think uh, it's uh, overdue to talk about uh, how the Hungarian defense sector is transforming uh, in the era or in the returning era of great power competition. So just referring back to what also has been said by Istvan at the time when we first met with the leadership of the Danube Institute last year to talk about this conference, our biggest concern was COVID and whether or not all invited speakers can make it to the conference. Happy old days, barely 90 days ago. Today, Russia is menacing Ukraine. European troops are conducting withdrawals from the Sahel. ISIL affiliates are on the rise again. Migratory pressure is growing on our borders. Afghanistan has already been left, and today it seems to continue descending into chaos. The world, unfortunately enough, seems to become more dangerous with every passing day. While the Ukrainian crisis is very central to our thinking, even today, we should not forget that our security environment keeps deteriorating also as a whole system. Both generic and particular benchmarks are pointing towards a less secure, more complex, and increasingly unstable 
future. Steven Pinker postulated in his famous and well written book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, that war as a social phenomenon might be fading and its impact in international relations is decreasing. Unfortunately, the last years are telling us that the frequency of conflicts and crises keep growing while the probability of a major crisis, either here in Europe or elsewhere, is also increasing. So is complexity, which introduces ambiguity into international relations, erodes the threshold of conventional escalations, and through the seamless, seamless generation of noise, it deafens strategic signaling. Thus changes the world around us. Under such circumstances, the ability and commitment to adapt is crucial. Defense should matter to all of us, both on, nas both on national and on allied levels. This is the reason why I would like to focus your attention today to the evolution of the Hungarian defense policy thinking in the last decade, how it was impacted by major shifts in our security environment, and how it evolved to its current state today. The story of the Hungarian defense policy is thus the story of a Central European choice aiming to become relevant, reliable, and agile. It all began, obviously, around 2014-2015. The illegal annexation of Crimea, the rise of Daesh in the Levant, the massive influx of illegal migration created a tragically perfect storm which have changed our security perception for good. I think we have done a good job in understanding these seismic shifts already while they were happening. After the first major signs, both from the East and the South, Hungary commenced a complete overhaul of its entire defense architecture from strategic concepts to equipment and training of individual soldiers. It all happened after almost 20 years of peace dividend and also after 20 years of relative peace. After 2014-2015, the Hungarian security and defense policy has enacted changes in both its posture and its mindset on a scale which have not been seen since the end of the Cold War. Deterrence and defense came into the forefront of our concepts, though it's true that it took another five years under the leadership uh, of uh, uh, Minister Banker uh, to be finally codified in our national military strategy. In 2015, after the signs of seismic shifts, we established the first NATO headquarters ever established on Hungarian soil, the so-called NATO Force Integration Unit, NFIU, or NEFU. This served as a plug-in for NATO troops in times of crisis, and it has also reinforced the security of the entire eastern flank, as part as the wider network of higher commands and NFIUs from the Baltics to Bulgaria. In 2016-2017, we have launched the General Transformation Program of the Hungarian Defense Forces according to the guidance of the 10 years long strategic plan called Zrinyi. This also served to gradually but firmly reduce the ratio of legacy equipments within the Hungarian Defense Forces in accordance with the Warsaw Resilience Pledge uh, pledged by the heads of states and government in 2016 in Warsaw. As a result, this ambitious and swift transformation, the first major procurements have already been finalized before Christmas 2018, thereby signaling a new era of, uh, for the Hungarian Defense Forces. During the same period, we successfully conducted critically important negotiations with NATO authorities on the alignment of national and NATO objectives. 2018, 2019 were major turning point in our transatlantic commitment because we have been able to integrate all NATO capability targets into our planning. This means that we can deliver what is required from us by the alliance in a 15 years time frame. Obviously, transformation is not happening overnight. By 2019, Doro preparations were already underway to establish a divisional headquarters in Central Europe by Croatia and Hungary. The idea was to offer a regional solution for NATO in the area, which lies in the intersection of the eastern and southern strategic directions. The HQ Multinational Division Center is the crown and the cloud of the army transformation, as it allows for seamless integration with other allied forces. It is also the true symbol of our commitment. The HQ is the first divisional HQ after 40 years. 
uh, in Hungarian soil, and this is led by a Croatian general, which talks length about how seriously we are taking multinationality. Besides different spending, accelerated allied integration and enhanced multinational capability development, we did not forget about unstable peripheries either. Since 2015, the emergence of illegal mass migration, we understand clearly that the problems of distant faraway places will not stay there, but will sooner or later reach us in a form of mass migration, terrorist attack, and organized crime. It is also the number one challenge on the Hungarian security threat landscape. As part of the international community efforts, we cannot leave the unstable areas to their own means. And we have to do a lot more for those people who want to live peacefully in their respective countries of origin. Thus, Hungarian soldiers are today being deployed in various multinational coalitions from Iraq to Mali, 6,000 kilometers from home, and their number soars around 1,000 packs per every six months. We are in EU missions, we are in UN missions, we are in NATO missions. We odd our beat everywhere where it is possible. With this operational tempo, Hungary is amongst the top allied and European troop contributors in relative terms, and it's punching well above its weight. But it's not enough. We also believe that military means alone would not suffice to manage peripheral instabilities. Thus, Hungary helps. An organization concentrating on the human aspect of security has also been established. When we talk about the need for concerted efforts to tackle peripheral instability, it is not a lip service to, to us, but an ambition which we are contributing well above our own relative weight. For us, it's a long-term strategy, which is showcased also in the case of Operation Inherent Resolve in Iraq, where Hungary maintained its contribution, even though other allies and nations have been reducing theirs. For us, the management of periphery instability means long-term commitment, regardless of political fluctuations. This is our recipe, and this is why we are staying with our US allies in Iraq. But it is not only distant regions which are to be addressed, if we want to increase our security. The Western Balkans is right at our doorsteps. We cannot turn the blind, out, blind eye to it, even though it's not burning. The situation in the Western Balkans today is relatively stable in comparison to other parts of European neighborhood. This good news, however, is creating not less, but more incentives for us to act, to devote NATO's and EU's attention to the region. From all the peripheries of Europe, it is only the Western Balkans where we have reasonable hope for the complete stabilization and parallel integration into the Euro-Atlantic structures in the forthcoming 15 to 20 years. Hungary, for its part, doesn't want to lose this momentum and pushes hard for the integration of these states while we are also shouldering the lead nation role in the K4 NATO mission. The current commander of the K4 is Hungarian for the first time in our history, and there are significant HDF elements within the mission, which all proves our unwavering commitment towards the security of the region. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished panelists, I sincerely hope that I was able to provide you with a snapshot, an honest snapshot, from the efforts of a nation to adapt to the changing security environment while becoming more credible, relevant, and reliable. This is a story of a Central European country which has tripled its defense budget during the last 10 years, sets up regional multinational formations, aligned its planning with NATO objectives while deploying significant number of troops in NATO operations and subsequently leads the largest NATO mission today. This all takes conscious efforts from both the government, the people, and the army the Clausewitzian Triangle. Uh, as a result, Hungary is shifting from being a security consumer to a nation which can contribute to the provision of security. We are today, in my humble opinion, in a dire need for more such examples. Thank you very much. Dr. Nemeth, thank you very much indeed for that very, uh, actually fascinating and thorough introduction. Uh, the, well, the things that actually make sure that policy 
foreign policy is actually achieved, uh, the failure to provide which means that it won't be. So thank you very much for that ex instructive and important meeting. It's now my great pleasure uh, to ask uh, Tamas Majuric, who's my colleague at the Danube Institute, and of course one of the most distinguished academic Americanists in, um, in Hungary, to take the chair for the next panel. And would I, can I invite the State Secretary uh, to, to join him on the stage? And the um, other members of the panel um, for the uh, next session, uh, which is a marking of the 100 years of American Hungarian military cooperation. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, whatever it is. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, let's welcome to the uh, second uh, panel. And uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, uh, State Secretary for Defense uh, uh, Policy at the Ministry of Defense of Hungary, Istvan Sabo. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Um, he graduated uh, from uh, Kaliningrad, uh, a.k.a. Königsberg, uh, a military college, uh, with a degree in fortified military engineering. Uh, after that, uh, he uh, uh, he uh, was working in various jobs, uh, and uh, uh, especially with regard uh, to uh, NATO cooperation, uh, studied at uh, NATO Technical Staff Office course, uh, NATO peacekeeping course and NATO reconnaissance. Uh, I really don't want to, uh, uh, to talk too much because uh, the uh, longer bio is in the program. Uh, so I'd like uh, to ask uh, the State Secretary uh, to uh, deliver his speech first. So thank you very much, uh, honored guests, uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen. First of all, let me Thank you for your invitation. I'm really pleased to join you in this uh, special session dedicated to the topic uh, of the Hungarian-US uh, cooperation. More than uh, 100 years ago, Hungary and the United States have uh, established uh, diplomatic relations. Much has changed in our country since uh, 1921. Although our historical, political, economic, and uh, cultural ties go back much further, uh, the establishment of the diplomatic relations formalized the enduring bond between our nations. This bond was unfortunately interrupted by World War II and uh, despite the signing of the U.S.-Hungarian Peace Treaty in 1947, our relations were strongly affected uh, by the Soviet occupation. It was no surprise that uh, after the fall of the Iron Curtain, Hungary knew that its future lies on the West. Thus, our main goal was the accession to the NATO alliance. While uh, diplomatic relations have uh, spanned a century, military relations only began with the change of regime. We have been partners on security since uh, 1993, when the joint cooperation between uh, the Hungarian Defense Forces and the Ohio National Guard started with the aim of enabling Hungary to prepare more effectively for the NATO accession. Over the following years, other institutional ties had been established and the United States provided significant assistance to Hungary in the modernization of the Hungarian Defense Forces in the framework of both bilateral and transatlantic cooperation. In 1999, Hungary joined the alliance, which took our defense cooperation to a new level. The United States has become a partner with whom we work together as allies. These all resulted great changes in the transformation of the Hungarian defense forces. To be exact, in uh, 1999, 
roughly 95% of the HDF uh, military equipment was of Russian origin. In, nine, in 2019, the tally was less than half of it. By 2032, it will be negligible. This very fact reflects that Hungary is committed and moving towards to meet the NATO requirements related to defense expenditures, reaching the 2% of GDP share by 2024. It is safe to say that uh, the modernization of the Hungarian defense forces is conducted in line with the agreed NATO requirements. Since then, this uh, US-Hungarian partnership has remained a cornerstone to this day. We share the common goal of preserving the security and stability in the region and the entire Euro-Atlantic area together with allies and our partners. Our defense cooperation has developed significantly over these last 30 years in terms of education and training, joint exercises, and the cooperation between our special operation forces, only mentioning a few key fields. Within the framework of bilateral cooperation, the Hungarian and US soldiers have regularly taken part in joint exercises and training events uh, to this day. Hundreds of joint operation activities have been conducted by the Hungarian Defense Forces and the Ohio National Guard. Our countries uh, have also deepened their defense relations by playing a key role in shaping and developing Hungary's national military capabilities. The Hungarian defense procurements, most notably the acquisition of the National Norwegian Advanced Surface to Air Missile System, highlights the excellence of our security partnership. Additionally, with regards to the defense cooperation agreement, we have advanced the implementation phase considerably. By the end of 2021, we took another important step by signing four implementing agreements under the DCA. We highly appreciate the continuous US support in various fields of our cooperation, such as among others in establishing the Regional Special Operations Component Command or in gaining the position of the commander of K4 and uh, in the Hungarian commander's preparation process. Today, the US and Hungarian soldiers are serving uh, shoulder to shoulder in the Western Balkans and other key areas, actively taking part in ensuring stability. While we are connected uh, by the NATO alliance, we are also bound together by common values and mutual security interests as well. Today, we are reliable partners, and we can say that we are not consumers, but providers of security. Beyond all these, uh, the US-Hungarian defense cooperation has always been the core and the driving force to the bilateral relationship. As strategic partners and allies sharing 100 years of diplomatic relations and almost 30 years of defense cooperation, looking back to this period, uh, we are witnessing a great, great development which we are eager to con continue improving the long-term security of our nations. So I look forward to a fruitful and rewarding discussion on the 100 years of Hungarian-American cooperation from all the distinguished panelists. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary Sabo. And uh, uh, I think that uh, it's time uh, we proceed on to uh, have the panelists. Uh, and uh, our first panelist is uh, uh, Professor Jeffrey Kaplan. 
uh, on my left. Uh, uh, he's an academic and an author, uh, has uh, published uh, in the excess of 10 books and, uh, and a number of uh, articles. Uh, at the moment, uh, uh, he's a visiting professor at Obuda University and uh, a distinguished visiting uh, fellow at the Danube Institute. And recently, he's been uh, teaching and uh, researching in uh, such exotic places as China, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and Hungary. So, uh, uh, welcome. And uh, uh, we are very much waiting for your contribution. Yeah, history not only has lessons, it has ironies. And mm -hmm. so I thought a good subject would be the American intelligence involvement, um, quote unquote, contribution to the Hungarian Revolution in 1956. In 1956, believe it or not, the entire CIA station was represented in Hungary by the CIA station chief and sole member of station, who was Mr. Geza Katona. And he was managing all intelligence gathering in Hungary all by himself. So you could imagine the kind of product that the Americans really got. Um, the, the Americans were absolutely puzzled by what was happening in Hungary at the time. And so one of the best places to go and get information, it turns out, were the bars and the taxis. And he made great use of these. But unfortunately, it didn't help very much in policy. So American support for the revolution was conducted, as we say, by other means. To make an excuse, the CIA at the time was all of eight years old. It was founded in 1948. Um, so it really didn't have a lot of people to spread around the world at that time. And most of the operations guys, the guys who actually did the interesting stuff, were from the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, um, where they had been trained by Wild Bill Donovan to the effect that there are no rules in intelligence, and they carried that out with gusto. Um, Alan Dulles was then the head of CIA, and he would frankly say later that he really was caught by surprise by the revolution. He didn't really know what to do about it or what to make of it, and so he didn't make anything of it. He just kind of, punt, as we say, punted and let the staff deal with it. President Eisenhower, understood a lot more about what was going on, but he also understood the risks of getting involved in the Soviet bloc. And he didn't think that there was much, the Hungarian revolution had much chance. And even if it did, we would cheer it on from the sidelines and perhaps give some material support as we could, but we were not going to get into a confrontation with the Soviet Union in a Yalta, in a post-Yalta Soviet bloc country. The risks were simply too high. Also by way of excuse, and this is somebody that whenever I give a class on intelligence and national security, the students are informed they must remember his name and stand whenever it is given. Um, this is Kermit Roosevelt. He typified what American covert operations were in this, in this era. He was given the assignment to engineer a coup in Iran against Premier Mohammad Mossadegh. He did that essentially by himself with $10,000 in funds and he brought back change and he, engine, he did indeed engineer a coup um, all by himself. The CIA station in Hungary was not about to try something like that. Um, it's just as well because what turned out in Iran was a pirate victory. We did change the government, but on the other hand, the long-term consequences have been a disaster. The initiative was therefore taken up by American information warfare, which was also in its infancy in those years. Um, the Soviet version called Active Measures was also in its infancy and it too started in 1948. So you saw two competing information warfare regimes 
um, being born and taking shape. And the Hungarian Revolution was one of the first places where that was tested. From the American perspective, we had essentially two instruments to use. One was radio broadcasts, which we'll look at in a few minutes, and the other was leaflet propaganda, which was even more interesting, ways to get leaflets into a country where nothing got into the country. So it was born by the winds. What made it especially interesting was from a domestic perspective, as you see from this middle one, these are all advertisements of the time. And that middle one actually invited Americans to get involved in the leafleting campaign by not only contributing money, but they, they field tested this in the United States. So they sent these balloons around with little propaganda things on it. And they asked Americans who found it to please fill it out with their name, address, where they found the thing. And so that's how we basically learned how to do what would become the balloon campaign. The balloon campaign came to be called Operation Focus. And what we wanted to do was focus Hungarians on the opportunities they had to stand up to the Soviet military and intelligence forces by themselves. It seems like not a great idea, but the, there was a lot to work with. So not only was foreign propaganda brought in, but the demands of the Hungarian opposition were also printed up and distributed in ways that the opposition itself really couldn't do. They were, they were restricted to samizdat, passing things from hand to hand. Here, it was blown on the wind in mass quantities. There were three programs at the time. And the Hungarian was by far the most successful because there was the most going on there. But as you can see, um, the Hungarian operation focus went from October 54 to February 1955, when it was basically taken over by radio. The Winds of Freedom program also included Czechoslovakia, which was operations Prospero and Vito in Czech and Slovak, respectively. And Operation Spotlight in Poland. The picture on the, on the left is the balloons that are actually being launched, in this case from the German border into Czechoslovakia. It was some of the earliest um, versions of it. They didn't actually have a payload in terms, of, in terms of documents, but they were simply testing the winds. They wanted to see where this stuff would go before they actually committed to printing anything. Um, the Winds of Freedom advertisement here is pretty much self-explanatory. But to give you an idea of the volume in the three countries, from 51 to 56, 600,000 balloons dropped over 300 million pieces of literature. And so it was, in that way, a very comprehensive, if not always effective, program. It had an effect. Operation Focus really alarmed the Soviets, who complained bitterly to the Americans in both Budapest, Prague, and Warsaw, and in the United States, to very little, to very little effect. Um, these were not officially a government operation. This was officially private, although as we'll see, the CIA contributed financially to it quite a lot. So it wasn't entirely private. Um, these are some of the typical messages. Um, the one on the left, four years ago, exactly 10 years ago. So this one came from about 1955. The one on the right, you see the Easter um, card on it. On the opposite side are a selection of passages from the Bible which talk about freedom and being freed from slavery. There's nothing subtle about this stuff. There was also a newspaper, um, a multi-page newspaper. There were eight issues of it. 
that were actually flown in. To give you an idea of what the capabilities of the balloons actually were, because they managed to keep these newspapers intact, and so multi-page propaganda was being brought in. And in this one, issue number one, um, the heading of it was, da da da, um, issue one, Hungary was carried by the winds to Hungary in order, da da da, free Hungary was carried by the winds to Hungary in order to voice the thoughts and feelings of the Hungarian people who are forced to be silent. We speak at a time when the resistance of the Hungarian people has achieved visible results, results which are recognized throughout the whole world where a free press exists. The second one is much more clever. I mean, this, way, the, this was an innovation that was very, very effective. It wasn't just the message, which was on St. Stephen's Day. Um, Cardinal Mazensky should lead the procession. But what made it interesting is that it was an adhesive sticker that people could find and stick to walls, make it into a bumper sticker, or put it on party headquarters. And there was a lot of that going on. So the, so the party people would come the, na the next day and see their doors and windows absolutely covered with these things. Um, there were no cameras in those days, the, <laughs> no SEC cameras to be able to show who did it, but these were everywhere in Hungary and they stuck to everything and you couldn't get the things off because it was a really good glue. This was probably the most popular and this is the baby one. Um, and it's in both Czech and Hungarian. And it was, I, did, I couldn't get a copy of the po uh, version of the Polish. But it says basically this um, on the text aspect of it. A special reporter of the newspaper Free Europe has penetrated behind the Iron Curtain to see what people here thought about the 10th Congress of the Communist Party, which was odd because the Russian 10th Congress was actually in 1921. But we'll leave that aside. American intelligence was not always historically acute. Um, he did not become discouraged by all the adults who simply shrugged their shoulders and shook their head. Instead, he took the bull by the horns and decided to question the younger generation as to their opinion of the Congress. Representatives of the babies answered his queries as follows. And I think the best one is the first one. The Congress, that's something like this rattle. It makes a lot of noise, but nothing good comes of it. All of us who remember or were in Eastern Europe during the communist era and surely have volumes of political jokes at the time. And what made this so popular is it fit very well into some of the tropes of political humor that you saw in all of the Warsaw Pact countries. While Operation Focus had an effect, it was really the radio broadcasts that were pushing the agenda. There were two primary Hungarian language sources coming from the US, or actually more precisely coming from Berlin, which is where these were actually broadcast from. Um, one was Radio Free Europe, which tried very hard to be as objective as they could and be a news source in countries where there were no news sources. So they were good enough that the Hungarians first heard about the death of Stalin and Khrushchev's secret speech, the de-Stalinization speech in 1953 from the Voice of America in Hungarian. So it was a, the, you know, the, the broadcasts were very interesting and they had very high status in that people listened to them and believed them. The Radio, the radio Free Europe was, as we'd say, more like the Fox News of the day. It was much more interesting to listen to, but its accuracy was sometimes questionable. More than that, it represented as much as anything the dreams and wishes of the Hungarian emigre community in the West much more so than American policy. And indeed, the American political establishment, both in the State Department and in the administration, were often appalled by some of the things they said because it was counter to American policy. But it was a Hungarian dream and it sounded good and it was effective. 
Unfortunately, that effect could have some very negative impacts, as we'll say, but it was quite effective. Together, this very much alarmed the Soviets. The leafleting campaign was an irritation um, largely because the governments involved would order people to bring the leaflets to the party headquarters or to the police, and nobody did. And there was no way really to reinforce, to enforce that. But it was, you know, these are just slogans that are going back and forth. There's not a lot of substance to them. It's more an irritation. But the radio broadcasts in an era where jamming was an imprecise science at best and was ineffective. This was genuinely alarming. And in many ways, it impacted quite negatively the situation within Hungary and the administration, which was desperately trying to mediate between the sides and looked like it was going in a progressive direction or a a reformist direction is the word I'm after. Um, they essentially were left with no audience in a period where radicalization and an increasingly panicked Soviet Union was right on their borders. So they were left with very little they could do. So it was like a house of fire and they were trying to find a spot that was safe. There wasn't one. As the crisis deepened, Radio Free Europe's broadcasts became more and more extreme. And to the extent that they were regularly called in to the American State Department and occasionally to the, administra to the administration to, and asked in the strongest possible terms to moderate their content. They never did. And this is, this is an interesting facet of the American intelligence operations at this time. Of RFE's $21 million budget, the CIA provided 16 million. But that other 5 million was from people making small donations um, in response to some of the posters and the advertisements you saw earlier. Neither the CIA nor the State Department controlled RFE. So because they really believed in a kind of First Amendment free press, even though they were financing it, they never actually controlled its content. And so they could complain bitterly about what was being said, but they didn't have the power to actually stop it or to moderate it. On the upside, the positive point is that this lack of control offered US policymakers plausible deniability. And in any intelligence operation, plausible deniability is the gold standard. You want that. Finally, by 1956, and this is where things go bad, and, this, and I'll give you one quote from it and then sit down because I've overdone my time, uh, as professors tend to do. But essentially what RFE was saying to the Hungarian people is, if you will just hold on a little bit, help will be on the way, and that help will be military, and you will be free. And here's the quote to, cl to close with. This was a broadcast from Zoltan Khuri in October 56, as the revolution was building. Essentially, he was saying that, well, we can't do anything until after the election, which was on November 2nd. But if you could hold on for just say four or six days, then the very day after the American election, when the president is installed in Washington, troops will be on the way. They were not. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation, and uh, really it was uh, quite a comprehensive view of whatever happened uh, uh, in 1956. Uh, uh, we move on to Istvan Kish, uh, who is the executive director at uh, the uh, Danube Institute. Uh, he was studying at Pazman University and uh, the University of Edinburgh, uh, and um, um, has been 
uh, political advisor uh, in the Prime Minister's office uh, uh, here uh, for some time. And uh, he's a colleague of mine as uh, a deputy editor-in-chief of uh, the uh, Hungarian Conservative and the Hungarian Review, uh, two of the so-called flag staff uh, publications of the uh, Bajtany Foundation. Third one is the European Conservative uh, are, and the editor in chief uh, is also here. So, Istvan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, well, um, I think I will <laughs> have a pretty, uh, pretty much controversial uh, speech here now. Uh, those who know me, uh, I think, know that I'm a great supporter of the United States and of transatlantic uh, cooperation. Uh, I'm a, as a dual British-Hungarian citizen, I have always been fascinated with uh, Britain and the United States. Uh, the first time I was in the United States, I was basically uh, getting overwhelmed, tearing up near the Statue of Liberty. The first time I went to the Capitolium, it was, uh, you know, one of the f most fantastic uh, transformational moments uh, which I had during my life. Uh, and looking at the, you know, the Hall of Heroes, Statue of Heroes, uh, was also uh, pretty amazing. And actually, I could still uh, see Robert E. Lee's statue, which uh, I could no longer, sadly, but back then it was still there. So I think I'm perfect uh, to play the role of a kind of a devil's advocate. Uh, of course, I will talk a bit about uh, how important our cooperation is, but I would also like to give a bit of a critique uh, towards our American friends on some aspects of uh, American-Hungarian relations. Uh, and I've, I'm pretty grateful that I'm actually uh, after Jeffrey because I think uh, the 56 revolution is uh, one good example uh, which I could start on, uh, which could describe some elements of uh, Hungarian and American uh, relations. Uh, as Hungarians, uh, we had a difficult history. Uh, with John and Nellis and Tony Abbott, we had a dinner uh, on Saturday and we were, were talking about why sometimes Hungarians feel that the West and of course the United States is, uh, is abo abandoning them and leaving them to their own devices. And uh, this goes back to our history. We were fighting the uh, Tatars, the Mongols, the, the Ottomans, uh, and I'm sorry to say, but <laughs> usually without much Western support. Uh, and this feeling was also pretty strong during the 56 revolution where what Jeffrey was also showing us, uh, besides some radio talks and uh, leaflets, there was no concrete help coming from the United States. Of course, we know why, we understand the reasons, but still this kind of uh, put a, a hurt into the Hungarian public psyche. And of course, after the fall of communism, uh, we felt that Hungary and the region was very important. I mean, if you look at the uh, bilateral relations and the visits of uh, foreign ministers of, of you know, Hungary, but other, other countries from the region to the United States, or vice versa, uh, American state secretaries or even presidents coming here, you could see that there was a um, golden age of cooperation between this region and the United States. Um, which I think was really good because the region could join first uh, uh, the NATO and then, of course, the European Union as well. Um, and even afterwards, even after these countries joined these two uh, corporations, uh, even during the Bush administration, perhaps because of the uh, Afghanistan war or the Iraqi war, where this region also put out uh, its troops, and I think... Uh, uh, especially in the Iraqi war, which was not really supported uh, in the beginning by Germany or, or France, this region gave its uh, whole wide support to the United States, which I think was important. So during this period, we again felt that the region is important, that uh, we have a crucial role to play. Uh, but I believe this changed uh, quite drastically during the Obama administration. Uh, of course, uh, to be fair on them, I to some extent understand the reasons. Uh, it seemed that the region already entered uh, the Western cooperation. Uh, Russia seemed like somebody who is uh, content. It, it was trying to help to some extent with uh, the war in Afghanistan as well. Uh, you had no major crises in the region. So of course, attention perhaps shifted more to the Pacific. Uh, but, which for me is a bit less understandable, is that again, it would seem that uh, 
while the region was becoming perhaps a bit less important for United than the United States foreign policy, uh, on the other hand, uh, the relations became more ideological to some extent. Uh, during my you know, university studies, I always learned that it was actually the Republicans who were more ideologically di driven than the Democrats in their foreign policy, which I never really believed because I think if you look at Nixon or some other examples, mm -hmm. uh, the Republicans were you know, surprisingly uh, flexible and realist in their foreign policy. But yes, perhaps, let's say, uh, during Ronald Reagan, where they were really fighting an ideological war uh, against communism, luckily successfully, or during the more neoconservative period of, of uh, the, the young Bush uh, administration, perhaps Republicans were more ideologically different in this sense than Democrats. But during the Obama administration, this was certainly the case for the Democrats as well, because uh, I would say that cooperation on military affairs, which was still important, and of course, under the level of diplomatic relations, which this worked pretty well, as Hungary was still a valued member of uh, these missions uh, in the Middle East. Um, there was no focus on this administration, at least on a diplomatic level, on other issues, uh, which was sometimes called the rule of law, or, or some other uh, you know, fancy word, but what it in reality was, it was more about uh, ideological conflicts, especially on, on questions of marriage or on national sovereignty. Uh, I might be mistaken, but I don't think that uh, family policy or saying that marriage is between a man and a woman uh, is something which has a lot to do with the rule of law, but uh, again, I might be mistaken. Uh, but this was not the, the case with Hungary alone. It was a case for the whole region, especially with Poland, but not just with Poland, other countries as well. That not just the ideological driven uh, policies were there, there was this kind of a sense of uh, abandonment. And this was especially true uh, during the uh, Ukrainian crisis. Uh, nothing really happened. Uh, we were, of course, there was economic sanctions, there was a lot of talk about how we should uh, do something against Russia, but no concrete uh, help was given. And again, still, uh, our talks were driven by, I would say, ideology and less than geopolitics. Uh, this changed with Trump to some extent. Of course, uh, he visited Poland, which was a huge success, uh, and the, f the region felt, again, a bit more import important. Um, but other than that, uh, on a diplomatic level, you could still feel these uh, questions. So now with the Biden administration, which during, I mean, his, during his presidential campaign, he was actually calling out regularly on Poland and, and Hungary, we again felt that uh, mm. instead of looking on how we can cooperate, looking on geopolitics, uh, we will again be driven by ideology. And I think that's still to some extent the case, although uh, with the current Ukrainian crisis, uh, perhaps Biden cannot afford to be uh, that uh, ideologically driven against Hungary and Poland, because I think they will need these countries uh, despite the circumstances on, on what will happen in the Ukraine. So this was the, the critique part. Uh, I think uh, I'm kind of running out of time, but uh, the things which bind us, which keeps us together are much stronger and much more numerous than some of those issues which have been dominated by mostly the liberal uh, media. Um, so Hungary has been a supportive ally of the United States. As I mentioned, it has been an active partner in some of the uh, foreign missions. Hungary, actually, if you look at uh, the United Nations uh, peacekeeping missions, is punching above its weight. Uh, compared to some other Central European countries, we have more people in these uh, uh, missions. Hungary is actually leading now the Kosovo mission, and the uh, Hungarian general is the, leading, uh, the leader of that mission now. Uh, our economic relations are, are excellent. Uh, the United States has always been in the top 10 uh, trade partners of Hungary. In investment, it has also been in the top 10, sometimes in the second and the first place. Uh, we have several American companies here, I think, in fact, more than 200, who are investing heavily in, into, into Hungary. So these are the, all the positive things which I could say about our cooperation. And I think we share most of our uh, 
values. Uh, we share a commitment to NATO. Hungary is, because of this, trying to up its military spending to 2% in the next couple of years. We have uh, actually made a defense cooperation with the United States uh, back in 2019. And we would still like to keep this defense uh, cooperation compact. So what we would kindly ask from Americans is uh, to not to abandon this region, to step up. Uh, for example, we hear a lot about how Hungary is not doing enough to diversify its uh, energy resources, which I think is not true. We're doing a lot on this, but uh, perhaps if there would be more American investment coming in or, or Western European investment coming in, especially in the energy policy, you know, for Hungary as well, there will be more uh, chances to develop uh, alternative resources to Russian gas. And this is the, the, the true for communications technology as well. I mean, a lot of countries in Europe were turning towards Huawei or other Chinese companies because there were no American alternatives for them, um, which is ludicrous because there are. But uh, I guess because America was more interested in other, other parts of the world or didn't have the self-confidence, these companies were not readily available uh, to support our region. So I think, um, to just summarize what I was speaking about, um, we don't really have that much disagreements which you would see in most of the liberal mainstream media. Hungary and American cooperation is actually pretty good. Uh, it's something which is cherished, I think, on, on a security level by both governments. And uh, I think uh, if America would like to keep its leading role in this region and in Europe general, uh, it should step up its investment on uh, areas like energy or uh, the communication industry. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, this was all. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for being so self-disciplined uh, as to keep the time. Uh, and I'd like to pass the word on to uh, Your Excellency uh, Rico Zemarkini, who has already been introduced, uh, and uh, uh, is just a person in law that uh, we've been knowing each other for a couple of years uh, and have been friends. Uh, uh, Rico has been... Uh, uh, provided or received uh, uh, or has received a number of awards uh, from Italy, uh, from France uh, uh, and the places. So uh, she's recognized uh, not just in Hungary and the US, but other countries as well for her uh, outstanding performance in the field of security and energy policies. So Reka, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I apologize really for being here. I'm honored uh, really very much for this panel, and I think it's a, uh, and I'm also very much um, congratulating the organizers for putting this panel on, because I think it is adding a very important element to our discussion. Um, so I, to compensate uh, for the fact of me sitting here a second time, I will try to be super short. And just to focus on a, a couple of, viewpoints or um, insights that I believe uh, we need uh, to reconsider in our relations uh, in Hungary's, um, uh, in this sort of uh, Central European um, geostrategic context. Um, we heard uh, that the US-Hungary military relations uh, are on solid foundations and are strengthening and in, are being in the focus of the uh, bilateral relations, and rightly so. It is something that is absolutely fundamental and, and very important for a long-term uh, cooperation and also for the security and stability of Hungary itself. So I think it's a typical question of a win-win scenario, of a win-win situation in which uh, through strengthening bilateral relations uh, uh, the country's own uh, national security considerations are supported very strong and very clearly. Um, but um, a question, uh, the question of, uh, of um, uh, bilateral relations uh, can never be narrowed to a few elements of the relationship. Uh, it's, it would not be a smart strategy in any case, and it certainly is not, it would not be a very start, uh, smart a strategy in the case of a, a complex relationship uh, like the US has with the rest of the world. Um, so what are the uh, 
potential steps forward? What is, uh, are there anything, uh, and is there anything that can be done? Are there any proposals or ideas that could be pursued to add on, to make sure that this relationship is not only strategic in one dimension, but absolutely clearly supporting the stability, the three S's, as we say, the stability, uh, security, and sovereignty uh, of uh, the partners? What are the, if, if there are any steps, what would they be and how could they be followed through? Um, in this, I think there are um, six points that uh, can be taken or uh, into consideration. Uh, one is the, uh, the foundations of the defense cooperation. Yes, the, the, uh, the DCA and signing the DCA is a very welcome uh, step forward and to continue along this line is a, a very important uh, venue in the future as well. There's a lot to do, so there's a lot to catch up. Uh, it took a long time, and I think it was uh, very important that finally it got moved forward, but uh, um, the catch up is, uh, is uh, something that is, has to be a priority. The second uh, um, uh, element, however, is against prioritizing, because I think uh, what is important is that the uh, relations with the EU and the US, especially, um, um, because of the very different nature of the two uh, organizations uh, uh, has to be taken very seriously. So there's obviously no security guarantees in the EU context, and there's absolutely clearly a very different or organization with very different uh, cooperation uh, logic and, and practices. So uh, that certainly does not replace in any ways the relations uh, with the US uh, in, under any geostrategic uh, circumstances. So no prioritization or no, uh, uh, no possibility of, uh, of choosing among the, uh, the two. Uh, number three, um, uh, there has to be a refocusing uh, uh, on the strategic element of, co of the cooperation. There is a very strong uh, military element, which uh, is very welcome, as I said, also in number, point number one, and as we have heard from the State uh, Secretary for Defense uh, just previously. But... Um, there are other elements of strategic importance that has to be added to the picture to, be, to provide a solid foundation for the relationship. And these other strategic elements are abundant. Uh, the, uh, the pressure of migration is obviously there on the region and uh, it is clear that there can be more, um, uh, a lot more to do and there will have to be a lot more to, to work on that front. Energy is a very important element. So, um, not only to add on an element, but to add on a strategic element uh, or one or two strategic elements to the, to the bilateral relationship uh, are also uh, could serve as uh, important pillars to strengthen uh, the cooperation. Yet another point would be uh, to get out of the explainer phase and make sure that the decisions speak for themselves. There are decisions, there are key messages that will have to speak for themselves and they will they will, believe me. So there's not necessary, it's not an, an unavoidable situation that, uh, that decisions have to be explained uh, on an international scene. Decisions, messages, uh, and uh, steps forward can speak for themselves. Um, and lastly, uh, uh, get engaged in a regional cooperation. Now, most of you who are Hungarians in the, in, the, in the audience would say, of course, Hungary is a strong and very active partner in all the Visegrad uh, uh, cooperation formats and is a big mover and shaker in this, uh, in this framework and everything is happening is on its right track. Uh, but we have to see that from a larger point of view, stepping outside of the Hungarian borders. The Visegrad cooperation is as much as it is an important and a strategic uh, cooperation pillar, it is not going to be enough for uh, securing the stability of the larger Central Eastern European region. The right format for that is probably in the, for, in the, in the phrasing of the Three Seas Initiative, which uh, is, uh, was launched by um, uh, Poland and which has become and has the potential to further become a very strong element of cooperation. There has to be, yes, there is a good strategic cooperation between Budapest and Warsaw. That's fantastic. I think it really is a great uh, you know, strategic asset for both countries. But that uh, has to be also profited for supporting and getting very active and very committed um, uh, to the Three Seas Initiative. 
the importance of, of having the Baltics in, the, in this framework, the importance of having the Balkans in this framework, all underline the importance of this larger regional framework. And there's a lot that can be done and has to be done in every field, just as uh, uh, I mentioned before, from energy to infrastructure to uh, uh, all kinds of elements that are important. So I think these are, uh, there is a way forward that can be pursued in a very strategic way. There is a lot that uh, can help both countries. And I think there is a lot that can help the, uh, the three S's, stability, security, and sovereignty. So thank you. Thank you very much, Rika. And uh, I have to announce a little bit of change in the program. I'm filling up the time and uh, like to comment on one or two uh, issues we have heard here. One of them is uh, about Cardinal Mincenti, and uh, just like to show you a book uh, which I've just received from the author. Uh, it's about Cardinal Mincenti and oral history. So uh, the American. Uh, employees at uh, uh, the U.S. Embassy where he was staying between 56 to 71, uh, you know, uh, gave testimonies uh, uh, how uh, they saw Mincenti, what was going on inside uh, the uh, U.S. Embassy, uh, and uh, this book has just been published, uh, and uh, would like to recommend to you. Uh, so uh, the hanging title is Mincenti Biboros. Az elbeszélt történet is Kardem uh, Mincenti in oral history. Um, then uh, uh, Professor Kaplan uh, mentioned uh, Ellen Dallas, uh, and uh, Ellen Dallas, in fact, uh, uh, got involved in Hungarian matters before uh, 56 uh, because uh, he was uh, working for the U.S. intelligence agencies uh, in the First World War and Second World War uh, alike, and. Uh, uh, he got into contact with Hungarian agents in the First World War, especially during the Second World War, when the uh, Hungarians uh, wanted to, um, uh, to have uh, secret negotiations with the British and the Americans uh, uh, in Istanbul, uh, Bern, uh, Lisbon, uh, Ankara, and a couple of other places. Uh, unfortunately, nothing came out of it. So uh, Alan Dallas, uh, as I said, was... Uh, 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 someone uh, who uh, who was playing a minor role in Hungarian history even before uh, 56 or during the Cold War when he was uh, the head of the CIA. Now, uh, recently we have been uh, uh, talking a lot about statues, uh, and I like to uh, talk about the statue here uh, because uh, one of the uh, subtitles of this conference is and the subtitle of the uh, panel is uh, 100 years of Hungarian American relations, and especially military ones. And uh, uh, have to start with uh, Harry Hill Bentholz, uh, whose statue is in front of the US Embassy. Uh, possibly. Uh, not too many people have heard of uh, General Harry Hill Bentholz, so especially in the U.S., uh, uh, people have uh, heard about uh, you know, a certain Ulysses Grant, a certain Washington, a certain Patton, and so on. But Harry Hill Bentholz is an unknown person. So Harry Hill Bentholz came to Hungary uh, as a member of the uh, so-called Allied Commission, Military Commission, in 1919. Uh, after the uh, suppression of the Hungarian Soviet Republic. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, the French and the British, uh, quote unquote, hired the Romanians and the Czechs uh, to do the, uh, the, the work. And the Romanians were happily marching into Budapest, and, uh, and an Allied Commission uh, was assigned to, uh, to the Romanians and to Hungary uh, to supervise uh, what they were doing here. Uh, the uh, Romanians uh, uh, believe that uh, uh, almost everything in Budapest uh, came from Transylvania, uh, from loco locomotives to telephones and so on. And uh, at one point, uh, a group of uh, Romanian soldiers uh, visited uh, the National Museum uh, with a huge truck. Uh, and the idea was to remove everything uh, from the museum that had come from, uh, uh, from Transylvania. And the, the uh, director of the, uh, uh, of the museum uh, alerted Harry Bentholz, rushed to the scene, uh, sealed the doors, and, uh, uh, and uh, told in, uh, in no uncertain terms uh, the Romanians uh, to get lost. 
Uh, ultimately, by the way, he uh, wrote uh, his memoirs uh, under the title of, the, of an undiplomatic diary. And the great Hungarians uh, erected a statue for him uh, in the late 1930s. Uh, and the statue is standing uh, in front of the U.S. Embassy right to the moment. Uh, during the communist times, the statue was removed because the Hungarian communists didn't want to uh, offend the sensitivities of the uh, Romanian uh, brothers and sisters. Um, there are two other statues of uh, American uh, statesmen standing in uh, Sobacak there. One of them is Roland Reagan, and the other one is uh, George Bush's, uh, I mean, uh, 41st president. And there are two other uh, monuments. Uh, one of them is uh, in memory of the Soviets, uh, 1945, and the other one in memory of the German uh, invasion of uh, 1945. So, we have three American statues and uh, uh, one remembering us, uh, the, uh, uh, the Soviet invasion and the other one, the German invasion. Um, I would like to jump to uh, 1932 uh, when a better known general was visiting Hungary and that was Douglas MacArthur. Uh, this is quite a, uh, an unknown uh, story. Uh, he came to Hungary and not just to Hungary, but to Turkey, Romania, Austria, uh, as the army chief of staff to uh, uh, to visit uh, the military here uh, and uh, to participate in military exercises. He was, uh, by the way, of quite uh, high opinion of the expertise of the Hungarian military at the time, which was uh, quite small, tiny, uh, because of the Trianon Treaty. Um, the last uh, uh, item I'd like to talk about uh, before the Second World War uh, is the declaration of war on the U.S. Uh, Hungary declared war on the United States uh, after Pearl Harbor, following the Germans, and uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, minister at the time, a person called Kleber Pell, uh, told uh, the Hungarian prime minister that uh, he very well knew uh, that Hungary had been under tremendous pressure by the Germans. And the Hungarian Prime Minister said that, no, uh, we were acting on our own. And then Pell said that, fine, uh, I take your declaration of war. And uh, when he was leaving, uh, it was a huge demonstration uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the Americans because uh, he was spending the last couple of days uh, in one of the hotels, uh, which are not existing anymore, uh, along the Danube. Uh, I mean, in place of that hotel, uh, you have um, the Hyatt, uh, or whatever sort of uh, hotel. And uh, the day when he was leaving, uh, hundreds of Hungarians uh, uh, turned out uh, with chocolates and uh, flowers. So the whole lobby was filled up with uh, all sorts of, uh, of uh, uh, issues uh, or, or objects. Uh, trying to uh, express our uh, uh, gratitude to Claiborne Bell and our sympathies uh, with the Americans. Uh, and of course, there is this very well known story about Frank Roosevelt uh, 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 getting the, uh, the line. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I uh, have to stop here, and uh, the, uh, uh, the story about Frank Roosevelt Hungary uh, will be told next uh, time, the uh, next conference uh, uh, the Danube Institute is organizing. So uh, we are uh, linked up to uh, Tomas, uh, who is uh, there at the Donbass. Uh, welcome, Tomas, and uh, uh, we are expecting the latest from you. Um, hello, good morning. It's a great pleasure to join you uh, via Zoom, and I would like to apologize to you that I cannot be with you personally but uh, due to the very tense situation, I was sent by Polish TV to, uh, to Donbass. But it's a great pleasure to be with you with such an honorable guests. And right now, I am around 30 kilometers from the front line in the city of Konstantinivka. And this is the last town before the front line and villages in the front line starts. And I, was, uh, I have been observing the ongoing crisis for the uh, last week here in Ukraine, and I would like to emphasize two things. Like, first of all, like there are, in general in Ukraine, there are no signs of panic due to the very tense situation. Of course, people are preparing for anything that, come, that can happen in the incoming um, days. Um, however, there is no panic. And unfortunately, I can say that people just get used to the warlike situation. That very often we are talking that the, that the war is coming. Actually, it is not going to be a 
war is going to maybe a new war, new invasion. But here the war is for eight years, and the people that I met, that I talking to, are, are underscoring that this war is still going on. There are shellings, there are people dying, there are desolated and uh, empty villages. There are one, around 1.5 million internal refugees, internally displaced persons here in Ukraine. And they, are, they regret that for the last years were forgotten about this war. There were no journalists, no correspondents, uh, but the war was going on. And right now the situation is different. But the, the reason why we are in such a crucial point um, in international relations and the uh, peace in the whole Europe is in danger is because we neglected this Russian aggression. Uh, this around 30,000 people who were killed um, in, in Donbass. Uh, in the front line with so-called Donetsk and Luhansk uh, people, uh, people republics. And I say so-called because, of course, these are occupied territories. Um, recently, uh, OC reported around 2,000 violations of ceasefire, and apparently Russia is conducting a fourth flag operation aiming at uh, justifying potential full-scale invasion. Of course, it is extremely hard to determine if such an full-scale invasion start, and if it starts, in, uh, in, in what direction um, it, can, um, it can start. But there are reports about different uh, provocations. We heard about uh, Ukrainian spies detained by uh, forces in Luhansk. There are information about people from occupied territories, so-called evacuated to Russia, but in my opinion, they are not evacuated. They are forcibly transported from these territories to, to Russia uh, in order to rise, to rise the tension. Also information about sharing by Ukrainian army positions of, of separatists, in my opinion, are rather false. It is contrary to that. It is um, uh, pro Russian backed separatist forces and Russian forces who are hitting um, uh, Ukrainian position. Today I talked to the soldiers and they are reporting about the shelling along the whole uh, the whole front line. So I think the, the, the most important message they would like to, um, um, to, to tell you today is, is that this war was forgotten. For eight years, global community allowed Russia to conduct wage a war in the center of Europe. And today, as we are thinking, um, Okay, if there is going to be a meeting between the President Biden and President Putin, what about phone calls, what about negotiations? People here are telling me, okay, we really don't care about, about what's going on somewhere there in Washington. It's too, it's too far. I am soon going to go to the small village called New York. It is a, this real name, but this village is a very different from the city of New York. It's a village um, which is partially destroyed. There is a front line just on the outskirts of this place. Even there was organized a marathon um, a, a few years ago, uh, which aim was which was supposed to be similar to the marathon in New York, and, uh, and which aim was to remind what about about what is happening in this New York here. So people are saying, yeah, maybe politicians are talking. We are the, as the experts and journalists are talking, but we have to live here for eight years. Mm -hmm. We are living in the war zone, and uh, it is something also for me hard to imagine. And uh, I think that this voice of common people, people should just move the Western community that we allowed something like that happen in the 21st century. Thank, thank you. you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, wondering if. Uh, Anyone would like to ask a question here? Yeah, I just like one uh, to ask one question. The reports that uh, uh, tens of thousands of ethnic Russians are leaving Donbas. Uh, are they uh, going across the border to Russia or moving to Luhansk or some other areas? Uh, <clears throat> right now, most of the uh, so-called border passes between separatist regions and Ukraine are Close. However, earlier, yes, it was possible for the people living here to, to move between those, um, those uh, two territories. 
of course, in Ukraine, there are different, there are also different opinions uh, about what is going on here, um, particularly among people in Donbas. Of course, there are also people, people accusing Ukraine for starting um, this, um, this war. Um, but of course, this is also due to the very high level of disinformation uh, in, um, in Russian media, which are for years claiming that here in Ukraine, there is a fascist regime which attacked um, the peaceful inhabitants of, um, of this region. However, due to my also previous experiences, because I was reporting from here since the year 2015, uh, the, the reality is very different. It was Ukrainians, not only army, but also military volunteers uh, who, were, um, who were trying to protect their land against the aggression. And right now, people seem to be rather united in, in uh, Ukraine. Most of Ukrainians are, <clears throat> um, are supporting a current government uh, position towards, uh, towards Russia. Around 60% are against accepting a um, Minsk Accord in the, in, um, in the meaning of what Russia claims to be, so given Donbass some very special um, autonomous, um, autonomous status. As uh, today, um, Finland say that uh, in 1939, uh, Russia started an aggression against, um, against Finland, and it occurred that it united uh, Finnish people. And I can see some similar processes here that Ukrainians are more united than they have ever been since, I think, year 2000, um, 2014. Uh, I also observed it yesterday when I was on the Maidan Nezalezhnosti, so Independence Square, it was an anniversary of the massacre during the Revolution of Dignity 2014, when more than 100 people were killed. And in Maidan Square, there were hundreds of people uh, paying the tribute to the ones that were, that were uh, killed. And also, <clears throat> one other maybe remark, when I was very close to the Russian border, in, uh, next to the city of Sumy, I was just two kilometers, it was the last village um, before the border, and as we know, there are hundreds of thousand troops amassed on the other, other side. And of course, I was asking people, aren't you afraid about what's going on right now? Aren't you afraid about this potential full-scale invasion? And there was actually one answer uh, saying, yeah, of course, we are scared. But if you are living next to Russia, you need to get used to this fear. So I think that people here are living with the fear in their hearts, the, the fear of the fear of war, the fear of another victims. And as this situation seems to be absolutely extraordinary for, for us, and of course the scope of the crisis is extraordinary, unfortunately here, this is a part of the day-to-day -day living. Thank you very much, uh, um, and uh, take care. We have heard that a couple of journalists have come under fire, so uh, you better be careful as well. And uh, we very much appreciate uh, your giving us this update about uh, the situation in uh, the Donbass region. Bye-bye. Thank you for, so much for your invitation. Please forgive me once again for the time online and enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye-bye. <laughs>